Hi, I'm Dr. Hans Toki, and this is another Urban Insight. Today's topic is the Adverse Childhood Experience Scale and its representation in Putnam's book, Our Kids. The ACE, or the Adverse Childhood Experiences, has been linked to risky health behaviors, chronic health conditions, low life potential, and really even early death. And the Center for Disease Control uh, incorporated the ACE into their research about how to read uh, things about children and youth and how they're affected by their experiences. For some perspective on the Center for Disease Control use of the ACE, uh, we need to understand the sociological ecological model that they use for designing how to measure impacts on a child. Uh, let's go through it briefly. First, the individual. The first level identifies the biological and personal history factors of someone, such as education, impact, substance abuse, uh, and uh, history of abuse. So this is where we begin to look at things uh, such as prevention strategies for uh, drug abuse and this kind of type of thing. Second, relationship. Uh, so to what degree is the person going to experience violence as a victim or perpetrator. So we need to look at their social circle, their peers, their family members, and how these contribute to their experiences. Third is the community. The third level explores this idea of schools, workplaces, neighborhoods, uh, and what do these do with creating and perpetrating violence. The societal, or the larger society, the fourth level looks at the broad social factors that create the kind of climate uh, where violence is going to be more likely or less likely. So things such as cultural norms as an acceptable way for conflict. This morning I was reading about uh, MS-13 in El Salvador and how MS-13 as gang culture is seen now as a protection mechanism uh, in that particular society. And of course, it's migrated itself to areas in New York, first in LA, as a protection mechanism against uh, immigrants uh, who were not being accepted in LA uh, to now various other dimensions of it, even here in the New York tri-state. So we see from uh, this social ecological approach that we're looking from the individual out all the way to the societal. So then, the Adverse Childhood Experience Scale shows how more adverse experiences one has growing up, the more likely they are to have a difficult time. Uh, so it's good to think of the number of events and how this is applicable to more problems uh, and how more likely this is that somebody's going to have a difficult life. One could say, though that there's a few extreme experiences and not just the number of experiences, can also have an adverse effect. So I'm not sure I totally agree with the numbers of events are the only measure, but certainly the more repetitive someone has these types of events, the more likely it is that the ACE scale is going to affect them. So for instance, experiencing a murder in a family or a uh, sexual assault, for instance, has a higher effect on someone's life than numerous small little petty crimes. One creates the murderer, the other the habitual thief. So if we're to look at a social acceptance scale, the murder is viewed as more deviant than the thief. There is just, where just one adverse event can mark someone for life compared to just having repetitive uh, moments when they're stealing candy from the store and increasing it to drugs or whatever the case might be. With the A scale in mind, I want to focus on certain specifics that relate to this and the way Putnam in his book, Our Kids, uses characters to define the issues. The reading shows us uh, how to distinctively uh, articulate these ACE experiences and particularly uses what we call the ethnographic approach or storytelling journalistic approach of Desmond and Elijah. These two represent the upper tier and lower tier that Putnam consistently uses that really reflect an American ideal of the upper and lower class.
So I think it's critical to mention cultural elements at play. For instance, an ace of culture certainly affects Desmond. He's an immigrant, and thus he does not carry generational poverty as a burden like Elijah does. In New York City, where I live, uh, I have many black students, and there's a distinct difference between the Caribbean and the U.S.-born family. Uh, in the Caribbean family, education is primary. Uh, one of my former students raised in Brooklyn in a Jamaican family, who's now an attorney, Natisha Williams, remarked in a recent panel uh, that I called Being Black in America, how her parents staunchly were strong on their children being educated. She says to be Jamaican was to be educated. The cultural implications of this are not lost on those living in housing projects where survival for food or survival for their own well-being uh, is really what's critical and the primary motivator for daily life. And this drifts into the distance uh, as one goes up in class. But certainly one living in poverty is determined about survival. Someone who is in the middle class, a Caribbean family for instance, is looking for education. So we see in Elijah the generational influence that affects his life from his grandfather and his father who both bring negative social influences into Elijah's life. Desmond on the other hand has parents who have affected him to reflect the middle class characteristics of the American dream. His father was an IT professional and his mother worked at the UN. There's the UN right behind me, right there. Interestingly, they moved to a middle class area in Atlanta, Atlanta being a city known for its professional black class. Well, I'm gonna get back to that uh, a little bit later. There are some distinct elements that are common to the middle class family compared to the poor family. And this is what I wanna focus on today because the ACE narrows itself nicely in this book down into these various practical characteristics. There are certain principles that guide us uh, how to rise into the black middle class. There's six that I'm gonna focus on. Education, jobs, influences of peers and neighbors, parental involvement, the discipline or the encouragement one gets from parents to uh, pursue different things other than the life they have, and sixth, religion. I'm gonna briefly comment on them along the way here. But I think these six are uh, articulated in various ways in Putnam's reading. Related to this, Rich Lowry of the National Review claims that there's really three, as he calls it, middle-class norms that creates the success sequence that's required. And this is what's required of black families to rise to the class. Number one, graduate from high school. Number two, maintain a full-time job or have a partner who does. And third, have children while married and after age 21, they should become parents. Of these three uh, characteristics, about 65% of whites carry this norm compared to only 45% of blacks. So this norm of his three compared to our six uh, are still social roles and rules that are required in order to rise up in class. All right, let's get into these six of them. Number one, education. At first, childhood experiences, the, uh, the scale, the A scale, demonstrates how when one packs on several crises over time, it makes it more difficult uh, for upward mobility. A good point to make here is that many families, there's a belief in upward mobility that kids will do better than they will. I go to school, I will do better. As Putnam argues, education is the most defining factor in ensuring this upward mobility alongside a lower score on the adverse childhood experience scale, the ACE. Education certainly is one of the keys, but I ask, is it the only one? 
I don't believe this is, nor does Putnam, and his research team uh, notes this in the scale, even though his book has an extreme emphasis on education as the upward mobility clause. Really, we're about to challenge this idea that education is the upward mobility uh, idea. Achieving success requires more than education. People also need connections, networks, and relationships to people in power. Behind me you see Manhattan, loads of networks and relationships and people in power. I mentioned the UN. The UN, right in that neighborhood there, there's about 30,000 diplomat families living who all are in various networks. So for instance, networks getting jobs into upper mobility often is related to who one knows compared to someone else. All education being equal, it's the networks that bring jobs. Of course this is true that it's the starting point. So at the UN, yes, you can have a degree in diplomacy or political science or whatever, but really, who do you know is going to get your upward mobility at the UN? Number two, jobs. Having a job is key, of course, to not living in poverty. And we know that 25% of African Americans live in poverty. The 2010 census showed us that 45.8% of young black children under the age of six live in poverty compared to 14.5% 14, 14 of white children. So poverty among African American children is very rampant. But what about Desmond's family? Why did they not experience this? Because they had good jobs and this cannot be underestimated. Also, they moved from Atlanta, from New York City, with the largest middle and upper class concentration of blacks in the United States. Yes, there's loads of black uh, concentrations in Atlanta, much more so than you would even have here. So being black in the middle class is acceptable in Atlanta, unlike other cities in the country. However, the Atlanta scenario does not truly represent black urban youth. But living in certain cities certainly makes it doubly difficult to rise in the middle class, particularly a place like New York or Minneapolis, where there's strong white communities who infringe on the accessibility to middle class jobs. Let's observe some of this. According to the 2010 census data, in Detroit, 42.3% of the population is lower income, and 82.7% of the population is African American. So in Detroit, being low income and being black is a social norm. Similarly, in Cleveland, St. Louis, Cincinnati, Baltimore, and surprisingly, Milwaukee, which is the hardest place to be black and rise. 24-7 in the article, the worst cities for black Americans show the effects of urban poverty in these black poverty cities. And the difference between white and black high school attainment in these areas are at 94.9% and 80.7% of the respective adult populations. So there's 14.2 percentage points, nearly double the national average of disparity between what? Black achievement and white achievement. It's really hard to get ahead in the worst cities for black Americans, which are Cleveland, St. Louis, Cincinnati, Baltimore, Milwaukee, and Detroit. White area households in uh, these types of cities are relatively wealthy compared to the nation with a median income of about 61,000, so firmly in the middle class. But black area households in these cities are relatively poor at 25,600. So these are the large income disparities. You need a job to try and get ahead. And if you're white, you can get a job. If you're black, you don't get a job in these worst cities to live in America. But distinct from not being good enough, 
This can create a pervasive culture of poverty where people really gain a fatalistic attitude about their lives. They believe they can't make it. And meanwhile, the middle class works harder and harder to sustain their physical condition and ensure that others are contained in their lesser positions. This creates that inequality. Take sports, for instance. Middle class families will ensure success of their kids by having them in sports of all sorts and extracurricular training and coaching. You're noticing lots of families jogging by me in the back or young millennials jogging by me just adjacent a half a block away. I can hear them now playing soccer and the field is loaded with young uh, middle class, middle upper class kids learning sports. Poor families can't afford this. Thus, their kids are no good at sports, and they don't want their kids playing ball. Number three, the influences of peers and neighbors. In the rise to independence of the young person who has learned po poor coping skills or life skills, this uh, surely is a tricky thing to talk about. Finding a home in subgroups outside of one's family, such as a gang, can wreak havoc on the youth who has poor judgment skills or has learned the codes of the street, as Elijah Anderson says, to place them into social rules and roles uh, that are really counterproductive to social mobility. Achieving immediate social status becomes more important than long-term thinking and evaluation of where one's going in life. And thus education is a long-term prospect, but it's not valued very highly because I don't do well now. So the disciplines required in education that challenge youth really doesn't have the same morally acceptable uh, role in those who are, for instance, in a gang. This is where the ACE shows us how the levels of youth, uh, sorry, the levels of crisis a youth faces will subsequently affect their ability to move into the middle class. And the socio-ecological approach here noted earlier also ratifies this fact. What do I mean by this? The environment one faces has a direct effect on their ability to move out of class. So we know this, where you live and the people you hang out with, the socio-ecological effect with the ACE over time affects who the person becomes. Number four, parental involvement in life and engaged parents. Family is the most primary social group a person interacts with. So as much as the ACE affects the family in crisis, it also affects the socio-ecological development of a person. We see this marked clearly in the family life between Desmond and Elijah. For instance, isn't it interesting to see how one can take up college for a, uh, how long it will take for a, a youngster to understand what parents do for them to push them for literacy? I mean, have you had kids like this or known kids like this where I don't want to go to school, don't want to go to school, doesn't matter, I don't enjoy it. So they don't appreciate this. When they graduate from college, they may not appreciate it. A few years down the line, they begin to appreciate. So an important quality for parents in this kind of environment is to have the perseverance and consistently uh, sustain this educational uh, role despite prevailing winds that may shift the child's life. So parental stability, while there's this shifting adolescent life or child life, is critical to attaining upward mobility. I think it's good here to link the code of the street to the Putnam reading and Elijah's troubles in defining a new lifestyle after he got off drug. What I do find peculiar about the story is much blame is placed on the parents and their behavior and less on Elijah. I think Putnam isn't helpful here. Elijah certainly influences it as well. Does he not want to admit he also creates his own dilemmas? Families and crises that do not react well to the storms of life, uh, to use that kind of an illustration, literacy is going to be affected. And we know this. So yes, 
families do matter, but it's not the only thing. Number five, discipline. Encouragement from parents to pursue different things because you don't get it among your others. Elijah's experience links so closely to the code of the streets uh, and how one learns their behavior in that environment that even after graduating from high school where one should have learned different social roles and rules, the rule of the street still wins out. The irony is that we know how Elijah does and we believe he needs more discipline in his life. But he also disciplines himself with the rules of the street and conforming to those roles that he's learned. He doesn't see this as discipline, but if he was to break the code of the street, there would be social and even physical repercussions from associates in his nefarious dealings lifestyle. Earlier I, earlier I mentioned the MS-13 gang. It's blood in, blood out. If you want out of the gang, you're going to be killed. And just this week in Suffolk County, four teenagers were massacred by MS-13. Why? Because one of them posted on their Facebook or in their online, wherever it was, I want out. You're going to be killed to get out of MS-13. Number six, religion. The reading has shown us how religion had a significant influence, especially on Desmond's life. They talk about being churchgoers and the influence of values of the church on their lives. So being a consistent churchgoer, the family used this as a habitual structure, a discipline really informing them how to live. So the question becomes, those who are disciplined churchgoers, does this translate also in a disciplined uh, lifestyle elsewhere? Well, it brings certain questions. It is true that religion brings values into the family that might not otherwise be there. But what about in a tougher home? Can they make it anyways? Well, we do know then spiritual fa spirituality does factor significantly uh, in how one aligns their life and they live positive morals and values, at least the way they interpret them. So does spirituality actually factor? I think it does to some degree. However, one could make the conclusion that this is true, but why then are there ch poor church-going people who are not as successful? It can't be just going to church or being involved in religion. It is not only spirituality, but also other factors that come into play. And of course, Putnam understands this, why the ace and the socio-ecological model are helpful. Well, we've gone through these six uh, different interpretations uh, and applications of the ACE and the socio-ecological model. Some final comments. Anderson would make the case that it's very difficult to break through the code of the streets, particularly as one continues to live on the streets. With this in mind, the hopefulness of Elijah's life is an encouraging result of the story. What I think, and Rich Lowry also comments in his article, work support and training programs in addition to education and college education may help someone in getting a job, but it's no guarantee as companies shift and change their workforces. So success for the middle class also requires the ability to shift career tracks when things change. I would hope someone like Elijah, through being able to deal with multiple cases of ACE, also has learned a behavior in how to shift. And this bear, bears a, a really positive future for those who've grown up in poverty, that they know how to deal with crisis. If it becomes a discipline, for how to get out of it, it will help them in work support and training. Finally, a student of mine made a comment that we should not judge people by race and class. It's not comfortable somehow. Well, I'm not sure we cannot judge people. The question is, what do we do with the judgments? On what type of judgments 
we are making. One can make positive, neutral, or negative judgments. Indeed, the ACE and socio-ecological models do exactly this. I test my students in many of my classes uh, with this social technique of attempting to assess people they don't know based on their own perspectives and conditions such as race, socioeconomic standing, clothing, and so on. Indeed, I encourage you to go sit on a bench somewhere and judge someone and ask yourself, to what degree am I judging them and how am I judging them? I think, though, judging that's negative is counterproductive to helping someone. What I'm challenging is we don't become so sanitized in making assessments of people, we don't want to judge them, that we lose the impact of what it means to be poor and the troubles they face. Elijah and Desmond and the way the book unpacks this through these scales is helpful. Judging also helps us check ourselves at the door about what types of judgments we're making and whether they're positive, negative or neutral. What do we do with the judgments is really the end of the day. In the end, Putnam's scale is useful because it shows us there's many circumstances beyond education that can affect the life of a child. This is certainly not anything new that's been discovered here. Uh, his research team has done well through this ethnographic process of interviews and site observations to find common factors and traits that bring a person down, keeping them in the lower class and hindering upward mobility movement. And then putting it through these scales and linking it to adverse childhood experience scale and breaking it down using the socio-ecological approach is certainly useful like we've done here today. These help us to judge effectively and really analyze. So people, let's judge rightly, not wrongly. I'm Dr. Hans Toki, and this has been another City Insight. Please leave your comments or questions, and I'll see you next time. Have a great day.